how he has made us to make progress. Progress in learning. Progress in yearning for more. And progress in earning all that heaven has for us. You know, don't they stop me with your amen? You no, no, no. Say the amen at the right time. You know that lady there. Amen. Let me finish before you. Don't shout me down. Now give me a good amen. amen. Before I continue, I'm a teacher. Teacher of the world. And when I come to class, I don't ever permit anyone in my class to shut me down by any action, by any word. Because, you know, we're here in Bielsa Medical University. If they're teaching those students the way they ought to go and what they ought to know in medicine, and if one of the students will shout, and another one will cry. Another one will do another thing uh, to shut the lecturers down. Will not have good doctors. And when you come to learn the word of God, there must be the yearning in your heart. I want to know. I want to hear. I want to learn. It's the yearning that helps you to learn you yearn, you learn, and what you learn is what will make you earn a good position in life, a good job in life, and you'll be the better for the thing you do because of the learning. Don't, talk, don't forget that. You yearn, you learn, you earn. Now, we're here, and the Lord has seen us through until this point, and I pray Everything we hear will become power in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, normally when I teach, I shouldn't tell you what I should tell you now. I review what I do in the past if I'm taking a series. And then I come, I land on a subject of the day. So, pay attention be patient. If your wristwatch is disturbing you, remove it and put it in your pocket. We are led by the Spirit, not by your wristwatch. Father, we thank you today and bless your name. We glorify you. You are a mighty God. You are a great God. And Lord, I pray that this day you open the heavens and you impart your life, your word, your power into everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our eyes of understanding and help us, Lord, to be stronger, Amen. to be wiser, Amen. and to have greater authority and power in the ministry, in the life, in the home, everywhere, because of what we learn today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Isn't it wonderful? That as we are coming to the conclusion today, we're starting with Grace, 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 that's the reason, the greater reason for being in the ministry. Grace, that's what brought us to salvation. Grace, that's what brought us to holiness, holiness and sanctification. Grace, that's what brought us into service. And as you look at the Acts of the Apostles, we are going to find, it says in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, it said that they had great grace. And with great grace and great boldness and power, they ministered the word of God. Chapter 11, Acts of the Apostles, when he saw the grace that was in them, he, continued, he told them they should continue and cleave unto the Lord. We can see the grace in the change of life. 
We can see the grace in the hatred of sin. We can see the grace in the law for righteousness. Grace. By grace are you saved? And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Grace. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us now. Grace is not dormant. Grace is not silent. And grace does not encourage sin. Grace does not encourage evil habits. Grace does not encourage a licentious life, teaching us that living all those ungodliness and worldly laws that we should walk soberly and righteously. We should walk holily in this life. That's grace. If you have another kind of grace that permits you to go on the way of hell while you are trying to get to heaven, the Bible doesn't know anything about that. Shall we continue with sin that grace may abound? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. God forbid. How shall we, who have been uh, delivered and set free and brought out of that sin, how shall we continue therein? Because being made free from sin, we became uh, the servants of God and we live in righteousness. And where grace was seen abound, grace also abound, so that we can have righteousness through the grace of God. Grace is the grace of God that also fits us for ministry. And Paul the Apostle said, I am what I am. He didn't say, I'm a mediocre by the grace of God. I'm a backslider. By the grace of God, I'm still chewing sin, drinking sin, by the grace of God. I'm walking a licentious life, a careless life, by the grace of God. He said, no, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and I'm set right, and I'm steadfast in the way of the Lord by the grace of God. So understand? Whenever you hear about grace, by the way, we don't worship grace. We worship the giver of grace. By the way, we don't bend or bow at the altar of grace. Grace has no altar. You know, grace is everywhere, and that grace is available. We bow. Not at the altar of grace. We bow at the altar of God. The God of all grace that comes to our lives and makes a change and makes a transformation so we come to the grace of god but we don't come into sin we don't come into evil we don't come into carelessness we live our lives our lives of holiness our lives of righteousness by the grace that turns our lives around already you know from the acts of the apostles you know, things that are important, number one, the Word. Number two, the Holy Spirit. Number three, the name, the name of Jesus. Number four is the heavenly vision. Number one is the authority of the Word in life and in ministry. Number two is the confirmation by the Holy Spirit in ministry. As we give ourselves and yield ourselves to the Lord, we're saved, we're sanctified, and then we know He shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. And it says, Tarry. And wait in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Because John baptized by water. But ye shall be baptized, immersed, deep, submerged in the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. And they waited and they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication for the men 
and the women. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all sitting together in one accord, in one place. And suddenly, there was a mighty noise from heaven. And the wind filled the whole house. And then tongues like a sofa came upon each of them. And they began to speak in another language as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then they went in the power, in the anointing. In the strength of that Holy Spirit, as they went on till the end of the Acts of the Apostles, and then they had the name. The Lord Jesus said, He gave us the name, the transformation through the name of Jesus for ministry. And you will see from Acts chapter 3 silver and gold have I known. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It happened. And that name continued to walk until the end of the Acts of the Apostles. And actually, I told you, there is not a period, a total full stop, an amen after the last chapter because we're now to continue in that same way with the word for the Spirit and for the name of Jesus. And I pray all this will work mightily in your life, in your ministry, in Jesus' name. Yeah. Ah, does I need a good amen now? Yeah. And now today we come to the heavenly vision. The heavenly vision. If there's anything that we can tell what sustains them, what made them to remain the way they ought to remain in power, in authority, and in success. And they were moving on with the gospel of the Lord. And many people were coming into the kingdom. It is because the heavenly vision was sustained as a authority. C, confirmation. T, transformation, S, sustainers. Sustaining the heavenly vision till the end. Sustaining the heavenly vision till the end. That's the subject for today. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 17. And it shall come to pass. In the last day, says the Lord, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. You understand? Acts, the Acts of the Apostles started with the need, the necessity of the Holy Spirit. And here we are told, here is the Holy Spirit poured out according to the prophecy of Joel. And it says, as the evidence, as the consequence of that Holy Ghost being poured out, poured out it says, and your young men shall see visions. And as you go through the acts of the apostles, that's what you'll find. You'll find visions there. He Heavenly vision. Chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 19. Acts, chapter 26, reading from verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. All the other apostles could say that. Philip could say that. The members of the church, they that were scattered abroad, who went everywhere preaching the word, they could say that. And those who established the church in Jerusalem and then in Antioch and in various cities all over the world, they that have turned the world Upside down, I come hither 
also. Every one of them could have said, whereupon, O king Agrippa, we were not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. And in our lives, if we had any vision at all, if we had any revelation at all at the beginning of the ministry, then if we're going to receive the crown, if we're going to receive the well done from the Lord on the final day, the vision he gave us at the beginning, we must be able to say, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. Think about it yourself. Let me give you my own experience, my own understanding of my own personal calling. As you apply that to yourself, from the beginning, even before deeper life started as deeper Christian life ministry, the vision he gave, that he gave me, the heavenly vision, is that people will get saved, their lives will be transformed, their lives will turn around, and they then will take the word of God that says, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. That was the vision. And so we started the Bible study of 15 people. Actually, before we started the Bible study, I was invited to the university over there, 1972. And he gave me the subject to preach. And to the best of my understanding of the scripture, I preached that, talking about salvation, transformation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things, all things, all things have become new. I deliver the message as I have learned in the world. Immediately I finished, I just dropped the microphone. Then somebody came and took that microphone. He said, wait, 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 everybody. We don't accept what the man has preached. He said, nobody can live above sin. Nobody can live without sin. They will all be sinning until they get over there yonder. What could I do? It wasn't my fellowship. It wasn't my ministry. It wasn't my congregation. They invited me, so I just sat down. Another person then came and said, no, hold on. We too, we don't believe, but let him go away. And after he's gone away, we'll settle ourselves. And then uh, that same year, the Lord brought me to that university to do my postgraduate in education. And I didn't want to have anything to do with that bunch because they said they didn't want the word of God. But God worked it out that eventually uh, they invited me. Actually, they were looking for a speaker, a great, great speaker. They had, you know, the meeting was on and the speaker did not come. So they came to me and they said, uh, would you please help us to, you know, address the people? And then I got up five minutes. I said, give me five minutes to prepare. And then I put some things on paper. And uh, God used me. And people were saved. And people repented. Lives turned around. And then the second day, the speaker did not come. They said, come on again. Third day, the speaker did not come. They said, come again. That's how the Lord made me at that time. In the midst of opposition. In the midst of contradiction, to carry the heavenly vision to them there. And by the grace of God, we then started deeper life there when I became a lecturer there, University of Lagos. And we had about 15 people. And then we went to the same vision, the same vision, not cheap grace that makes people live a defeated life, a sinful life. Grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Grace that purifies us within grace that makes us to live a life that God himself has ordained. 
If Christ died on the cross of Calvary, crown of thorns upon his head, or the lashes upon his back, almost naked, shameful death. And then after that, all we have is living a sinful life that will be painful to the Lord. But he died to give us grace, the grace that lives in righteousness. And since that time, by the grace of God, I've continued publicizing, proclaiming, preaching that heavenly vision. I've found people that have openly to my face, I've rejected, and have told me they didn't want that. I could tell you stories of people that came, they fasted, and they came with what they call prophecy. And he told me that this will not continue. They said, God sent them to me to tell me that there's no holiness. I said, God sent you to me for me to tell you that without holiness, you will not get to heaven. He wanted you to hear. That's why he sent you to me. Not that he sent you to me to tell me that there's no holiness. I didn't allow anyone, not choir, not worker, to change the heavenly vision, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. And we're sustaining that. I'm sustaining that. I do crusade, but I'm still deep alive. I go to other churches, but I'm still deep alive. I help all the people I can help. I will not allow crusade, help, helping others to take the heavenly vision away from me. It will not. I said it will not. By the way, choir, if you are deep alive, choir, when you come to sing at the crusade, don't bring that worldly dancing, don't bring that into the, you know, crusade where deeper life is organizing. And then don't bring all that kind of dress that I saw last night. The woman shall not put on. That would belong to a man. When you wear a jacket like I'm wearing now, that belongs to the man. When you wear your trousers, whatever make that belongs to the man crusade doesn't mean that we forget where we're coming from crusade does not mean that we forget the heavenly vision and we bring the world into the church it was tough yeah. and so you pastors who are here don't say i saw those uh, deeper life uh, choir members the ladies I saw the way they dressed. I saw what they put on. I'm going to go to my church and do that also. Those are incorrigible members of deeper life. We have, you know, different, um, you know, categories of deeper life. The people who respect their pastor, the people who love their pastor, the people who accept everything their pastor is saying, they wouldn't do that. They don't see me sitting in on the seat there and then bring the dancing of the world and the dressing of the world right in my presence there and say if we can do it in his presence we can do it in his absence maybe you can because that's your nature the nature of incorrigibility but whatever people do to me whatever people do in my presence I I've made up my mind, I will continue with the heavenly vision. How about you? I said, how about you? I might tell you the whole story. 1977, as I continued, my overseer then in the church I was going, he called me and he said, Kumui, didn't even say brother, Kumui, this thing you're doing, you know, it's going to land you in trouble. I said, what am I doing? You're going about your preaching. We're not giving you ordination or license to do that. 
I said, well, the Bible gives me the license to do that. He said, Bible, are you quoting Bible to me? I said, well, Bible believers now. He said, okay. And then the following Sunday, they went to the church, announced my name, and they said, I was excommunicated, sent out of the church. And I couldn't attend that church again. I didn't drop the heavenly vision because of that. I faced opposition. I faced contradiction. I faced people who had iron for their backbone in their incorrigibility. That didn't change me. But yes, that will not change me. Yeah. I came with the heavenly vision. I came with all my heart, wanting to sacrifice everything I've got to hell in my Elsa stage. And whether they are choir, whether they are ministers, whatever, my Elsa stage will not steal and take away the heavenly vision from my hand. Yeah. Give me a good, good amen. Yeah. You'll be unhappy if you heard that after I left by Elsa stage, that you know the attitude and the actions and the dressing so weighed me down that it made me tired. I couldn't continue anymore. I will continue, yeah. and you will continue yeah. in Jesus' name. Yeah. You say, Pastor, are you fighting this morning? Yes. Honestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Fight the good fight of faith. They want to take the gospel from you, you don't fight. They're taking holiness from you, you don't fight. Your own children you have raised up, they are taking the kernel of the gospel, the power of the gospel, the righteousness of the gospel, the holiness of the gospel away from your hand, and you are not smiling. You don't have what it takes to keep the heavenly vision. But by the grace of God, I will keep the heavenly vision. And to all the choirs all over the world, belonging to deeper life, don't bring in another sin because of crusade. Let the holiness remain. Let the righteousness remain. Let the change of life remain. Because the world is at enmity with God. And if you bring in the world, you become an enemy of God. This church, they palive. Crusade or no crusade. Minister's conference or no minister's conference. Everything the Lord had revealed, we're going to keep unto the end in Jesus' name. Amen. I will. I, will. I said I will. I will. I will. Sustaining the heavenly vision till the end.